All right, welcome to part B of lecture 19. Let's take a look at the silver standard in China. So there's the Qing dynasty, the Qing dynasty, the last imperial dynasty of China. The Ming dynasty, which had issued a fiat paper currency that hyperinflated beginning in the 15th century, collapsed, uh, fell in 1644, in part because of this hyperinflation, although other factors as well, but the, the uh, financial problems suffered by the Ming dynasty were uh, uh, ranked high among the reasons for that dynasty's decline. Well, the Qing dynasty takes over rules for about two, uh, a little less than three centuries long. And you'll recall from a previous lecture of a thriving Pacific trade of American silver coins minted in Mexico and in Lima, Peru, pieces of eight, shipped to the Philippines at Manila, which was a Spanish colony until 1898, and then, and then exported to China to mediate exchange all over East Asia. So that Spanish dollars, pesos, pieces of eight, became a very common coin in major Chinese port cities. And in fact, by the mid 18th century, there were an estimated 235 million pieces of eight in major Chinese port cities. And this trade, again, uh, th this coin mediated much of the East Asian trade. Well, in the early 19th century, a Chinese, the Qing Dynasty determines to uh, create a, a new silver coinage. First of all, they adopt, uh, abandon the caste method of making cash coins and adopt mill struck or uh, machine uh, struck coins. And in, in 1889, create a new unit of account called the yuan, the yuan. And of course the yuan remains the main unit of account in China, but beginning in, the, in that denomination is established in 1889, but even decades before that, silver coinage is beginning to, to enter into circulation. A, a, a silver coinage created by the Qing dynasty, not just pieces of eight. But this new denomination of yuan in 1889 standardizes it, and the yuan is given the same silver content as the Spanish dollar, the Spanish piece of eight, again, because of the, how common that coin was in these Chinese port cities. The Qing Dynasty continues to also create cash coins, but now supplemented with a silver coinage. This coin here was called the Silver Dragon, Silver Dragons, and again, same contents of piece of eight. Isn't it interesting how the two global rivals right now in the 21st century, America and China, their currencies are both uh, rooted in uh, the Spanish piece of eight. Uh, the US dollar is called the dollar because of the Spanish dollar. And then the yuan has its roots here also based in initially on the Spanish piece of eight. There's another silver dragon. You'll even notice here it says $1, $1. and uh, cash coins as well. Actually, cash coins, after 1900, the Qing Dynasty stopped putting a hole in the middle and they became just ordinary coins. And so after 1900, no more hole in the middle of cash coins. Also, banking emerges in China but the banks are not run or managed by Chinese. They're established by European powers, first by the British. Why the British? Well, in the 18th century, and especially in the early 19th century, the British East India Company gets heavily involved in the opium trade in China. And opium becomes wildly popular in China beginning in the 18th and especially the 19th centuries. And the East India Company, which has access to opium fields in South Asia and in parts of Central Asia, takes advantage of this new demand in China for opium 
and ships unprecedented quantities of opium into China. And you, you look at this graph, here the numbers are how many chests were exported per year, and each chest of opium constituted 140 pounds. And here's the tonnage. So that by 1880, almost 7,000 tons of opium imported into China every year. And it just absolutely devastated Chinese society and Chinese culture. We've seen this today with our own opiate crisis in our country. It's a, um, a totally debilitating drug. And in the early 19th century, the Qing dynasty, the Qing emperor, put a ban on opium imports and confiscated East India Company property. I was bringing, uh, I forgot how many tons of opium it was, but a large quantity, sum of opium, and the Qing government confiscated it. The British government responded by declaring war on China. And this, of course, was the first of two opium wars, first erupting in 1839 over this trade. Britain wins the war and forces open China, forces China open for this opium trade. Also, as, as a result of the first opium war, the British gained control of Hong Kong Island, Hong Kong Island, which is located right here. Now, Hong Kong today also includes this whole peninsula, but that wasn't leased to the British until 1898, and then it was leased for a 99-year term, which uh, was surrendered in 1997. Of course, today there's a huge struggle over what to do with Hong Kong. I'll resist the temptation to make any comments about that. But in 18, but the initial acquisition of Hong Kong Island was made in 1841, and this was used as a base for British trade into into China and through much of East Asia. And the British established a bank and centered, headquartered in Hong Kong. This British run HSBC. HSBC, and we've all heard of HSBC. It's a major bank, a Hong Kong and Shanghai banking corporation. It's established in, let's see if I have the exact year here. Maybe I don't. Shortly after, shortly after the first opium war, but, but it's used to finance. It's used to finance British activity in East Asia, uh, trade between China and British India. Also, trade that's funneling through Shanghai as well, which uh, the British established some economic interests there. Um, the HSBC acted as a banker for the Hong Kong government, the British colonial government in Hong Kong, also managed uh, British government accounts in China and Japan and Malaysia and Singapore, and really became a big leader in East Asian trade, the biggest financial institution in, in East Asia, issued banknotes, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, a banknote, redeemable on demand, in coin. And then by the 1890s, other European powers get in the game. The Germans, the French, the Japanese, all established banks in Chinese various areas of Chinese port cities and carve out their own sphere of economic influence throughout China. So China is never colonized formally. Nevertheless, in the 19th century beginning, after the first opium war, and really through, up through the Boxer Rebellion and the revolution in 1911, um, China has, is essentially economically carved up and the currency reflects that. So you have HSBC, private banknotes. These are virtually unregulated um, and, and managed by, by Brits. And the German banks, the French banks, Japanese banks unregulated by the Qing government, and they all issue notes. By the end of the 19th century, there were nine foreign banks operating in China with 45 different branches in these various port cities. 
and and as a result of the uh, of unequal treaties made between China and, and, and the West, these foreign banks were, like I said, unregulated and totally free to issue banknotes or to accept deposits from Chinese citizens, make loans to Chinese merchants, and all the rest. Um, and so this really, uh, you know, Chinese, the Chinese refer to this period between um, the 1830s and 1911, uh, the the century of humiliation because the Chinese again while not colonized it was very clear who was economically in control and and that was the West the Boxer Rebellion will later uh, uh, sort of draw the line in the sand and, and communicate to the West that there's only so far they could go but the currency reflects that the banking system reflected that European dominance in China in the 19th century same with Persia uh, Persia um, was not colonized. Persians were run by a dynasty called the Qajar dynasty. They have a silver coinage. Actually, the Persians were the last major country to still use a hammered coinage. As you can tell, this is a hammered coinage. They didn't abandon hammered coinage until, uh, until 1876, after which a um, milling press was introduced. There's the result of that new milled coin after 1876 in Persia. It's a silver standard in Persia, just as it is in China and in India. Another silver Persian coin. And there was no bank in Persia until 1889, when the British established a bank in Tehran called the Imperial Bank of Persia. Now you look at the title of that and you would think, oh, that must be run by the Qajar dynasty, by the Persian government, but it wasn't. It was actually the Imperial Bank of Persia. Their headquarters were in London. So the Imperial Bank of Headquarters, or the, the Imperial Bank of Persia headquartered in London, even though its main activities were in Tehran, and it was managed, owned by the British, subject to British law, and so they were able to get a, that in that way, able to get a, around some of the uh, Islamic prohibitions on, on usury and such. And the bank received concessions from the Persian government and the Persian government gave them the privilege of having a monopoly over banking and a monopoly over note issue in Persia, along with tax free status. It's a British bank in exchange for this bank financing infrastructure projects and other capital intensive activities. There's the Imperial Bank in Tehran and, and the, the Union Jack. Yeah, you got the Persian flag too, but the Union Jack. The British were, uh, even though they, they never colonized Persia, were deeply interested in Persia because of its adjacent location to India. And the Brits were very wary of possible Russian uh, um, influence in Persia. And they were worried that the Russians might use Persia as a base to attack India in some future war. That never happened, of course, but but the British are looking out for that. And so the British have an interest, a stake in Persia. Later, the Anglo-Iranian uh, oil company will change its name to British Petroleum, but BP, British Petroleum, also gets its start in, in Persia. Anyway, I digress a bit, but this Imperial Bank of Persia, again, a monopoly of, on note issue. Here's a, a bank note of that Imperial Bank the Imperial Bank of Persia in English, of course. But they do have, they put Persian symbols on the front. The dynastic ruler of Persia also featured on the front. So you, you still have Persian iconography on there, but it is a British bank. And then finally, to conclude part B, Latin America, silver standard. Most Latin American countries after independence from Spain in the 1810s and 1820s, retain the peso unit of account. Mexico, of course, is among them. There's a Mexican peso from 1871, the Republic of Mexico, one peso. And after independence in the 1820s, there were private banks that were established in Mexico and they, and they, and they issued competing banknotes, but in 1874, the National Bank of Mexico was established 
and here is a and this was the largest bank in mexico at the time here's a 10 peso note of the bank national bank of mexico but this is a silver standard country and these notes were rede redeemable on demand in silver pesos um, there were other units of account and in, in, uh, other names excuse me for units of account elsewhere in latin america peru used the sol sol but here too silver standard there's a uh, a banknote a peruvian banknote redeemable on demand in silver souls brazil which of course used to be a portuguese colony retained the old portuguese denomination of real so here's a brazilian banknote empire of brazil and a silver Brazil Brazilian coin from 1856. All right, that concludes Part B. And uh, for Part C, we'll take a look at two uh, interesting exceptions to this general rule, Japan and the Ottoman Empire. So see you for Part C of Lecture 19.